All set. Excellent. Welcome, everyone, to Become a Cybersecurity Ninja, a 10-part webinar series. Today's session, Basic Network Security. This is session two of 10, and we have with us a special guest who I'll introduce momentarily. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, just to quickly go over our ninja plan, Two weeks ago, on the 24th, we started off with threat modeling and risk assessment. Today, we're doing network security basics. Uh, in week three, actually, the title's changed. Instead of authentication, we've called it Your Passwords Are Broken. Uh, that will be on February 21st. Uh, these, these titles and topics may change as we go through, but we'll see how it goes. We've got encryption on March 7th. We've got Gone Phishing, Social Engineering and Ransomware on the 21st. We've got Mobile Security on April 4th. Digital Privacy, VPNs Tour, Reigning in Social on April 18th. Security Tools, a review of our favorite tools and services on the 2nd. Now what? Incident Response and then a wrap-up and, of course, our Cybersecurity Ninja Quiz on May 30th. So that is the, the full plan. I, of course, am Joshua Peske, Vice President of Technology Strategy at Roundtable. Roundtable helps uh, technology, um, I'm sorry, we help hundreds of organizations achieve their missions through effective use of technology. And I'm going through mine fast because I want to introduce Ken Montenegro. Ken, tell us about yourself. So uh, thank you, Josh. And uh, So I'm the IT Director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, and I've been doing this work for creeping on 20 years, and so I'm really glad that uh, to be part of this. Thank you, Joshua, and Roundtable. And I think that the format that Josh has presented is wonderful because I think when it underscores how security is really a process rather than a product. So I guess we could get dive on in. Let's do it. All right. So Ken's going to start us off at the beginning today on basic. Network security, we've got, I'll just give everybody like 15 seconds here to read this cartoon before I hand it off to Ken. Um, but uh, I, this is not what we're trying to achieve, right? Um, I joke a lot of times that there's always a balance, or not joke, but I kind of point out to people that there's a, a balance between security and convenience. And generally, although not always, when you increase security, you decrease convenience. So this cartoon, I think, demonstrates that taken to the ridiculous extreme. And Ken, with that? Off you go. So cool. As as we begin this session today and you review the learning objectives, there will be space for questions at the end. So if you see something here that you feel is relevant to the topic of network security, please, please, please put it in the chat and we'll try to cover it um, time permitting. Do you want the next slide, Ken? Slide, yep. So we're, you're going to be seeing a poll um, right now, um, and we'd love to see your response to these questions, or this question. Go ahead and close that up then and show the results. Awesome. This is uh, actually really promising to see that uh, so many folks are uh, within the upper hand of uh, the response rate for this. Um, and there, there are reasons that we could dive into really deeply. Here's the short version of it. The 40%, you know that the firmware exists, so that's always a good thing. I actually to think about it through the 60% that responded. Um, and the 30% that knows Awesome, kind of good, and we'll get into that in a, in a short bit. Cool. So this is a, a typical network diagram. I say typical because as organizations grow, um, the posture will, will change substantially. Some people will have their um, Wi-Fi hanging off to the side in a completely parallel network. Um, other people will not have this orphaned workstation. But the general concept of this is that at the periphery, at the border of your network, the best practice is to have a router firewall that is controlling traffic in and out of your network. 
Um, one of the reasons why you want to do this is a router firewall, or at least a business class router firewall, will let you do some logging. So you'll be able to analyze and study what traffic has been going in and out. And when we think about a business class firewall, what differentiates that from your home device is that a business device will usually have things like web for the ability to buy licenses to do things like web filtering, some data loss prevention, sometimes they even bundle a VPN, like a really basic VPN functionality in there, which are all really good um, elements of a network that give you a lot of flexibility, give you and your staff a lot of flexibility as to what you can do with it. Um, You'll notice that in, in this diagram, we have all the elements that even a small network would have. So we have to incorporate the consideration of what do we do with personal devices that staff bring into the office, like smartphones, personal laptops, organizational laptops. We also have to think about storage as one of the factors that um, we'll hopefully be diving into um, time permitting. Like what, are the, what are the elements that a server could be running and how is that part of a, of a network um, architecture? When we think about the primary roles of a firewall, it is really, really the gateway between your local network, so the computers that are just like roaming around in your office, connected generally, usually by Ethernet, um, to the big bad internet. Um, and as a, the image shows, or the figure shows, that, you know, sometimes there's good stuff, sometimes there's bad stuff, and you really want to keep the bad stuff off um, your network. A lot of folks will say, well, you know, we're really small, why do I need to network? And I think there is a, um, a substantial cost benefit to networking, and to do it right, we have to do it securely. So if you want to share printers and files, etc., um, the data shows that there's increased productivity when people are able to share these things very easily in a very uniform and simple way. Um, and when we're doing this, we want to make sure that security is not an afterthought, but really one of the primary factors uh, in this design. And part of that design is determining what type of traffic we allow to come into the network and to exit the network as well. A lot of times it's easy to, easier to just say, well, you know, I just want, um, port 443, which is secured um, HTTPS traffic coming into my network, and only this other type of traffic leaves. I would say this is a good opportunity for a user-centered design because you'll be able to identify what are staff doing on your network, and by doing that, you can kind of adjust your security posture so that when you're securing things, you're not creating a huge inconvenience. Um, and I think that it merits the bold that it has, that errors in configuration are really common means of a breach. That's kind of a, the low-hanging fruit. Someone will, an error in configuration could be unnecessary ports open, like if all traffic is allowed in and out. Um, an error in configuration could be default passwords. Um, or turning on services like VPN that your staff don't need and that you don't intend to use, but you turned it on anyhow because, well, we thought about using it and we never got around to turning it off. Um, and so going back to the, the um, consideration of auditing, where the scanning of inbound and outbound traffic um, is one good way to identify is something fishy going on the network. So if you have a computer that is a very loud talker, like generating a lot of traffic, it could be someone who just loves their cat videos. Um, or it could be a machine that is uh, part of a botnet, so that is uh, under the command and control of a foreign computer doing something else. So as I, as I said earlier when we were looking at the larger diagram, an additional role of a firewall is it could do content filtering. What that means is that let's say in an environment, depending on the firewall, once again these are very contingent on how the manufacturer implements it, you can buy a license to do content filtering which says certain people, like let's say in our office, interns cannot click through to adult web content. Staff, I work at, I'm lucky enough to work at a legal aid, so if our family law unit needs to click through to what is classified as adult content, they get a splash page that says, are you sure? And they say, like, hell yeah, and they're through, and they get to the content they need to do their work. For interns, we try to be a little bit more protective of them because we don't have that um, degree of trust and, and sophistication and super direct supervision that like let's say a staff person does and and so that would be 
what content filtering does. Um, there are many ways to do content filtering, so sometimes that's built into the firewall as an additional feature. You could also do that using um, um, DNS, which um, um, Cisco bought um, OpenDNS, which has a product called Umbrella, but there's also the free version, which is just OpenDNS. So there are many ways to do kind of content filtering um, and, and seeing it and using it as, as threat mitigation. As I said earlier as well, uh, a lot of firewalls and routers come with a VPN functionality. And the reason why a VPN is very valuable, and, and I'll use our use case scenario at Advancing Justice, um, our legal case management system lives on our physical network. If someone, if an employee um, is doing work at a legal clinic, they have a hotspot, they launch the hotspot, open their laptop, and connect to our office through the VPN, and they have to enter a username and password, and they have to use a second factor to authenticate, which will be covered in the next se session. Um, and so we know that our data is not outside, generally speaking, out or to the best of our knowledge, outside of our dominion and control. And a VPN allows us to do that. Um, an additional role is bandwidth allocation and throttling. Usually that's meant um, for things like quality of service. So if you have a voice over IP system, your firewall will usually have a setting that'll say, hey, I want to pr prioritize X type of traffic. That's awesome. It really, really improves the user experience. So the person watching the goat videos or the cat videos isn't stealing bandwidth or taking bandwidth is a better way of putting it, isn't taking bandwidth from a more priority and unforgiving application like voice over internet protocol. Um, the other thing that you can do, and, and what we do, is we have a backup connection. Um, the backup connection is a lower quality connection. So we have our main fiber connection, and we have the backup connection. We put things like um, Spotify, Pandora, um, ESPN, we throw all of those kind of more entertainment type of um, functions onto our backup connection. So we can say, okay, our main big fat connection is really for hardcore, we think you're working type of functions. The backup connection is for more recreational functions, which we will, we will generally allow in our office. Uh, but it's important to have that control and that granularity so that you can uh, control the user experience. When we're talking about controlling user experience, we can't do that without network monitoring. Network monitoring is one of those uh, critical aspects where we need to know what devices are up, what devices are down, what devices have access, what devices don't have access. Without that, um, we really don't have, I would dare say, that you don't have a, a fully functional network unless you know what's happening on that network. So, key factors to success. Current firmware. I'm a big fan of current firmware. And that sounds easy, but I think in a business environment, there are a couple of steps to getting to current firmware. The current firmware generally, to me, at least in our shop, the process is we make sure that we're not on beta firmware. We try to stay away from beta firmware because if something goes wrong, everybody will suffer. In our office, at least. And that means that we'll be like, the fulcrum of the suffering. So current firmware generally means not beta firmware. Our current firmware process also entails, we make a backup of the current configuration of the router before we install a new version of firmware. It's a step that's easy to forget, but it's a step that has saved our lives a couple of times, well not our lives, but has uh, really avoided a lot of pain a couple of times where we'd have to revert to, to um, a previous configuration. Proper configuration, like we talked about earlier, proper configuration is a configuration that works for you. Generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of this configuration will work for everyone. And I also like to tell my users, you're the experts in the area that you work. What functionality do you need? Tell me in like your regular work language what you need, and we'll try to translate that into tech. Um, and that means that then that manifests itself generally by making sure that you know the necessary ports are open, that we don't have anything unnecessarily running, unnecessarily open, that if someone has a user control issue, that they can get through that user control issue. 
it's also very important and it's difficult because these are the things that are invisible and kind of superfluous until you really need them. Nothing is evidence of that more than documented change controls. It's easy for us to say like, hey, I'm going to add this service, let's say um, Google Play Music to my backup connection configuration or a better example, which is a real example where in our office we said, oh, you know, Amazon Music Player. Um, Amazon Music Player, we're going to put that on the backup connection. We did that and then we broke Amazon Web Services from going on the big connection. So document your changes. Backup configuration, it's already been mentioned, and alerts for anomalies. I think that's really, really important. And then that would be the basic factors to succeeding with your firewall and knowing what you have, knowing what features you could add. So this slide is a uh, really more academic in nature, but it shows the various manufacturers of firewalls and uh, where they stand in the Gartner quadrant. So Gartner does uh, really good industry research and usually top right um, quadrant is uh, where you kind of want to be though. Look at all of these products as kind of uh, not bad um, per se depends on your needs. So this is very important. Things always change. It's important to always try to, to not try, to actually make the time to do assessments. Um, fortunately, there are many tools and, and Joshua has a nice list of various tools to do assessments. The Fortinet assessment is pretty solid. Um, have a look at it. Um, run it, your firewall vendor might have their own assessment, so you may not even have to go this route, but please, please, please do a network assessment. You will learn so much about how things are running. All right, so Ben, uh, throw up the next poll, and we were just gonna, we're gonna shift into wireless. We wanted to ask everybody very quickly, how confident are you that your organization's Wi-Fi or wireless networking within your office is set up securely. And we'll ask everybody to uh, let us know whether you're very confident. Um, we were going to ask you more specific questions like the type of encryption, whether you're using WPA or WPA2 or WEP, but we felt like probably a lot of people wouldn't know. Uh, so we'll just leave the poll open for just another couple of seconds, see if anybody else gets in. We're missing a good number of votes here. Here comes everybody. Great. And uh, go ahead and close that up, and let's take a look at the responses. So everybody does seem to have Wi-Fi. So no one here does not have Wi-Fi, and no one who doesn't know what it is. So that's good. So <laughs> we've got a, a – that tells me if the audience is, uh, is, is fully savvy, which is great. Uh, not a ton of people very confident that the, that the Wi-Fi is set up securely, although uh, almost 60% of you are somewhat confident. That's good. Uh, all right, let's uh, close that up then. All right, so Wi-Fi basics, okay? So let's start very quickly with uh, your SSID, which is a service set identifier. Not that anyone cares. I didn't even know what it meant. I, I knew. I, you know, heard the term SSID for 20 years, but I didn't know what it stood for until I looked it up for this webinar. Uh, and that's the name of your wireless network. And one thing a lot of people don't know is it can be hidden. Uh, and that's a, a quick way to kind of add a, a nice layer of security to your wireless network is to actually hide the name of it. <clears throat> it makes it significantly harder for people to connect to it because they have to know how to add a, net, a wireless network by name, but it is a good <clears throat> little security thing that very few people do. Uh, it is good practice to segment your network into public and private zones. So you might have a private wireless that actually allows access to your LAN. So people can access maybe your file server, maybe printers, other things. And then you'll have a public that's for guests who come in that's internet only and again might be throttled, right? So you might throttle for that segment. Uh, for encryption, and I just, I, I put the picture here because I want to be really clear about this. Uh, you have all these different options for, for, for encryption. WPA2 AES encryption is considered the most secure um, that is available on most devices. So if you have that choice, that is your best choice for encryption. And I can't say any more clearly than that. Mesh networking. So what does mesh networking mean? Um, I've seen a lot of organizations where they have a wireless access point and it's not covering, so then they buy a second wireless access point and put it in a different place and they maybe have two different SSIDs. 
because they're two uh, different access points. So they, you know, you're when you're in one part of the office, you connect to one wireless access point, and then when you move to the other, you have to connect to that other wireless access point when you lose access. Or maybe they give them the same name, but they're not actually connected, so there's not a kind of seamless handoff among the wireless access points. So what mesh networking means is you actually buy a bunch of wireless access points that are all part, you know, from the same manufacturer that are designed to all work together. Um, and every, you know, Google recently released a, a new thing for home Wi-Fi, and, and if you look at like Google Home Wireless, they have three of them. And the idea is you, you spread those three things out around your home, and they have really good wireless mesh networking around your home. Other uh, ubiquity are the ones that. Roundtable generally recommends to clients. I'm not a reseller of that or anything, so it doesn't matter to me, but we really like the ubiquity packs. But don't be stingy with the wireless access points, with the WAPs, all right? So, you know, they, they tend to cost somewhere between $75 and $150 a pop, and if you have a big office, just add additional ones, but make sure that you're doing mesh networking. It makes it so much easier, then you can just walk around and the, the little access points will just seamlessly hand off your computer from one to the next. So you have good coverage without ever having to think about it. Key success factors for office Wi-Fi, all right? Again, current firmware, you'll notice that coming up. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a number of different reports out, a number of different webinars that I've attended from uh, different security folks where they're like incident response teams and they do summaries of like, here's all the, the causes that we found behind breaches and out of date firmware, unpatched systems and misconfigured systems is pretty much everything, um, phishing and you know those kinds of things, which will come up in the in the uh, security awareness, is another way. But often those things can't be successful unless there are things that are out of date. So this this firmware thing is is super super important. Okay, now WPA2 AES encryption, public and private segments to your wireless network, and then sufficient coverage for a mesh network. And Java wants to update, speaking of uh, update firmware, uh, Java wants to update my computer right now, which is great. All right, uh, another quick poll. When, uh, before we jump into the next session, when did your organization last perform a vulnerability scan? Now, uh, this Fortinet uh, kind of, you know, threat assessment that they do or checkpoint or lots of other providers uh, is a way of kind of doing a quick vulnerability scan. Uh, you can, and, and we'll get into these in a little bit, but I'm curious to see uh, what people are, so go ahead and, and please do vote on this. Let us know, when did your organization last perform a vulnerability scan? If you don't know what that is, we're going to talk about it in a little bit, but if you don't have any idea what a vulnerability scan is, probably you haven't had one. Uh, so Ben, let's go ahead and close that up and, uh, and show everybody the results. And this is about what I expected, uh, that there's not a lot of this going on. We do have a couple of folks that are doing these in the past three months, and no one that has ongoing vulnerability scanning happening, it looks like, um, as a surface. Let's go ahead and hide that then. And let's talk about what vulnerability scanning is. All right, so there's two different, uh, essentially, places you can scan. You scan your local network, right? We talked about how the firewall separates your LAN, or your local network, from your WAN, which is usually the internet. All right, so we can scan from the WAN side and basically see if there are open ports on your firewall, if there are misconfigurations on your firewall, if your firewall is out of date firmware. There's things we can look at from the WAN side, all right, that can typically tell us if there's problems there. And then on the LAN side, your internal network, all right, that requires generally someone, you know, putting a little appliance or installing a piece of software on some computer or attaching it to your LAN and that will collect data usually for a week or so, and then that will produce a report of vulnerabilities, okay? And that the LAN side ones will typically produce, especially if you've not done this and you have a large local network with lots of computers and servers and endpoints and printers, they will find a lot of stuff. And it can, you're gonna want help sort of prioritizing which of those findings to address, but I'll, I'll kind of show you. So this is a kind of sample WAN vulnerability scan report. This is from TrustWave, and I, depending on how big your computer is, but basically it's just identifying on a particular IP address, all right, which is 10.70.30.12, so that's a WAN IP address. That's someone's network, right? And we're, we're looking at it, and we're, we found these various vulnerabilities, which then are given a sort of severity rank, and if you click on one, you can see we've clicked on the TCP, TCP state manipulation denial of service, and it kind of walks you through basically the problem and what to do about it. 
The first time you do this, if you haven't done this in a while, it's a ton of work. I do this with lots of organizations, and the first time we go through it, we might find like 20 different things that we have to go fix on the firewall. Once you get through them all and you fix them all, then you just keep running the scans, and typically you'll just have one or two findings you know, every quarter or every six months or when you rerun the scans. All right, here's a LAN vulnerability scan report, and this is from Checkpoint Free Security Check, and um, there's a link in the, uh, in the resources to, to have this done, and you can see we found all kinds of stuff. This is one page, by the way. I'm including links to the sample reports as well. Uh, this is just one page of what I think winds up being a 30 or 40 page report that you get from these. So again, these are, they're free, but they give you a lot to look at, okay? Um, so that's something to think about. We're going to talk just very briefly, because we're running up against time, about antivirus. And uh, <laughs> so opinions, I just want to kind of say, Ken, this is where I, I encourage you to weigh in, and Ben, you as well, um, to, to kind of get the different antivirus opinions, just to show everybody that even among the three network people here, uh, you know, you'll get varying opinions about the, the uh, uh, importance and value of antivirus. However, this is Roundtable's official position, which we've had to develop because we get asked this question multiple times a day, right? We still strongly recommend for Windows endpoints, including servers, that they run some kind of antivirus product. We do not believe that Macs need to run an antivirus product. We are okay uh, with our clients not having antivirus on their Mac computers. And if they want to use it, we typically recommend a free product called Sofo, uh, which we like. On Chromebooks, which increasingly people are using, um, again, no need for antivirus in our opinion. All right. And then the last thing we'll say is that for the Windows endpoints, or if you're going to have antivirus for Macs as well, managed solutions are better than unmanaged. What does that mean? So you can install Microsoft's free security essentials. You can download free, you know, Avast Home or Malwarebytes or things like that. But those are not managed solutions, meaning they're just individually installed on individual computers, and there's no ability to know if they're up to date. There's no way to send alerts to some sort of central uh, communication if if there's malware detected on a system. So managed solutions like Semantic Endpoint or AVG Cloud Care or Kaspersky Enterprise uh, or Avast Enterprise, which is available, I believe, free for nonprofits uh, through, through TechSoup, and, and Semantic Endpoint, which I'm not a fan of, but is available uh, at a steep discount through TechSoup uh, for nonprofits are, are good solutions. The key thing I do want to say is that antivirus by itself is no matter what, no matter how well it's implemented, is not by itself sufficient defense against malware threats. It is not. And if you think it is, then you're, you're at risk. So Ken, Ben, either of you want to dissent from anything <laughs> I said there strongly, I, I encourage you to do so if you, if you feel it in your heart. And, and also in the audience, too, if anyone wants to put in, you know, in the chat, you know, strong disagreements with anything I just said. I, I can give a slight more a slight bit more context to the Mac question. Um, for okay. years now, the opinion has been, ah, you don't need any kind of antivirus on Macs, and um, and that's generally been true. However, that is as, Apple's that is Apple's official policy. By that way, is right? Apple's Apple... official policy. Yes. Right, right, right. Unfortunately, under that, <laughs> you do still and you should always maintain a good secure password for your administrator accounts like you would on any other Windows, Mac, Linux, doesn't matter. Because although Macs are less susceptible to malware and you know web-based viruses, if something does get on your machine and you are an administrator and do not have a strong password and um, they can basically craft a screen that says, please just enter your password for this, you know, this Flash update or this Java update. <laughs> Uh, it can, it, it's basically like there was no protection. Um, so, uh, yes, it is optional, uh, but it, it is optional when also used in conjunction with a good, strong password and normal administrator lockdowns on your Mac. So that's, which by the way is our, is our, is our webinar in two weeks. Perfect. Password. Yes. So we'll talk about that. You could not have set us up any better, Ben. Uh, yeah. Uh, so question uh, quickly, we have, how do we get the free vulnerability scans from Fortinet? There is a direct link in the resources. We'll get there. Ken, did you have anything you wanted to, to throw in there? And thank you for that, by the way, Ben. 
Yeah, that was pretty solid, Ben. But <laughs> let me add and kind of go in a different direction. So at Advancing Justice, we've been using Sophos, for, Sophos antivirus for more than 10 years. What's cool about Sophos is Sophos has a free product for Windows and Mac that just anyone can download. Since we are an organization that needs a managed solution, and just diving into managed solutions uh, for a quick second, um, building up on what Joshua has already shared, for us, a managed solution is very important because we need to be able to deploy it update it and monitor it without having to go to every single computer. So that is the, the blessing or the, the benefit of a managed solution is you're able to see, hey, what applications are uh, really causing like a lot of issues on machines? And what I mean by that is, so Sophos looks at it through the lens of endpoint protection and a lot of other, um, what used to be traditional antivirus vendors are looking at it that way as well, where, or is an application taking a lot of resources on the machine? So it'll do heuristic analysis. Sophos for business, which is what we use, it does application control. It does data loss prevention. So there are all these things that have kind of evolved in the antivirus space. I'm a big fan of antivirus on the Mac because the Mac is such a big target. And I think it's such a big target because Apple, I would have to say, is somewhat irresponsible in their official position that, oh, if you have a Mac, you're safer. And I think that was true when Mac wasn't a very big attack surface. But nowadays, it isn't a big attack surface. And uh, two weeks ago, I was doing a presentation at City University of New York's law school. And that was one of the things that we talked about was how their network is now very serious about antivirus on Macs because there's a lot of bad stuff happening on Mac. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say on that. The other piece too you, is, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. The, the other piece no, too is that. that I totally made there was, and, and there he is, yeah. he's great, he's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, the, the other thing too with Apple is um, it, it has not been considered for, uh, I would say any of its lifetime that Macs are used um, primarily in a business setting as well. So Apple's, uh, as Ken says, irresponsible position, which I actually I, I agree with, um, was geared towards more consumers, um, where you as an individual by yourself are not much of an attack um, surface or, or, or a you don't have much of a reason to be attacked as an individual. However, if you bring that machine into an organization, which then has organizational data and you know financials, and if you're a nonprofit that does lobbying, you know you know it's an extra layer there as well. Um, so if, if you're just a consumer, maybe you can get away with not having it, but if you're in an organization, um, and you're, specifically if you're using organizational materials and infrastructure, uh, it's certainly something you want to consider as a, as a business. So, uh, and, 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 that, and that has been a growth market as well. Um, more companies are actually deploying Mac antivirus, um, as well. So. So I'm just going to paraphrase what you guys said to summarize it as saying that um, basically Apple's position is irresponsible and they their position can roughly be described as they don't care if uh, freelance graphic designers have their systems uh, hacked with malware. Is that is that a reasonable summation of what you guys are, are saying? I think it is. All right, so we're going to go on. Just we, uh, In a cynical view, yes. Right. <laughs> In a cynical view, yeah. So what's your biggest challenge on network security? Then we're going to wrap up for, uh, for questions, all right? So what's, what is your biggest challenge around network security? Ben, if you could go ahead and launch that pull up. All right, is it, uh, and by the way, I, I you know, uh, go to webinar only lets you put in five options here. So I'm hoping that people will mostly be putting stuff into the questions box. So you can pick malware protection, firewall configuration, you know, wireless configuration and support, monitoring alerts. These are things we've talked about today. Uh, but if, if those, if none of those things are your biggest challenges, then please enter into the questions field. What are your biggest uh, challenges around network security? So we can uh, maybe talk about those a little bit, and we'll uh, we'll show you the resources. We'll talk about the next session, and then we'll uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, we have Pete here saying monitoring and alerts, and I do think that is a, for a lot of people uh, a big big challenge. Uh, we have Destiny, uh, I think referring to Shadow IT, which is human bypassing security through various means. Uh, these are all really good questions. I'm going to go ahead and uh, clear some of these. Hang on a second. So we have room to see all these. Uh, good stuff. All right, Ben, you can go ahead and close that up and share the results. So malware protection, still number one. Interesting. So biggest challenge is malware protection, firewall configuration, wireless. People seem to be pretty on top of monitoring alerts, a big one. And then uh, a bunch of folks are entering stuff in. 
to the chat. Thank you, everybody. This is super helpful information. So here's the resources we talked about. Uh, so I think I was asked to ask the question uh, where these are. So there's links uh, to the sample land vulnerability report for Checkpoint, uh, the sample security checkup report from Checkpoint. So those are just PDFs of, to show you what the report looks like. Uh, an article called Is Antivirus Really Dead? that just came out on February 3rd in response to uh, one of Firefox's leading engineers basically saying antivirus is dead. Uh, given that Kaspersky is an antivirus company or malware protection company uh, and, uh, you know, they have a particular take on it. But uh, anyway, uh, the sign up, Beth, you asked for that. That's for Checkpoint. I think if you Google uh, Fortinet uh, free security checkup or cyber, I think it's, a, oh, I'm sorry, I have the link right there. Look at that. I'm so good. Fortinet free cyber threat assessment. So those are the, the two free ones that, that I can recommend. Um, I've, I've done work with both those organizations, uh, Checkpoint and Fortinet, and I like, I'm, I'm comfortable with their products and their reports. So I appreciate that. And next session, passwords, password managers, two-factor authentication with guest Keith Berner of Freedom House. I want to thank Ken Montenegro for being with us today. And thank you so much, Ken. And thank you, Ben Gardner, for uh, helping with the webinar today and giving us your thoughts about antivirus. And, and thanks for the little antivirus free for all at the end and we'll we'll stick around for a little bit. I don't know Ken how long you can stick around for, but I'll I'll be here for at least five or ten more minutes for questions. And uh, we've got a, a couple in here. So uh, let's see. All right, one question. So a seventeen person works in a co working space where each floor is on a specific Wi Fi that does have a password, but it's not the most they're looking for tips on how much how to maintain as much security as we can. Um, being looped into what's essentially an, a semi-open network. So I certainly have a clear idea of how I would do that. Uh, Ken, do you want to answer that or do you want me to take that on? Or Ben, do you want to? Go ahead. Far away. I want to hear your answer on this one. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So first of all, a lot of what you can do about being secure when you're dealing with a shared wireless network, right, um, is first option would be to see if there's an option to have your own network, right? Um, a lot of co-working spaces will actually sometimes let you put in your own firewall and then set up your own wireless networking for your staff. So if they'll let you do that, that is an option. And then you're separate from that whole group. So that's number one. Uh, number two is probably a bit harder because it requires you know, a, a larger organizational change. And I think you said you're a 17 person organization. And that would be training, you know, making sure that all, you know, basically all the things that we're going to talk about in the rest of these sessions, which is everybody's using two factor authentication. They're using strong passwords. They're always encrypting sensitive information before it's in transit um, and when it's at, at rest. There's a lot of things that may sound like a little gobbledygook because we haven't gotten through the rest of those sessions yet, but all of those practices in place would mitigate a lot of the risk of being on a shared network. Uh, the other thing that you can have people do is to use a VPN. So they connect to the wireless network and then immediately fire up a VPN and then they're doing everything through the VPN. So I would say that that's probably what I would say is the second easiest solution. So number one would be if the, if the co-working space will let you, put in your own firewall and wireless and use that. If they won't let you do that, then have all your staff use a VPN. And if they if that doesn't appeal to you, then option three, which is just all security practices being very strong. So Ken, that's my response. Do you have anything to add or, or protest yeah, about that? I, I would I would go with the inverse, but I think those are like really solid practices. Where I would suggest the VPN first, because I think the VPN solution also inspires a culture shift. So it inspires staff, especially when we're talking about people who are co-working. That means that they're working not only at a co-working space, they're working from home, they're working from coffee shops, or is in a formal office, where I think if the VPN solution is the primary recommended and kind of like the policy-driven solution, then it helps that um, practice trickle out. It reinforces that practice. And of course, like Joshua said, that VPN um, kind of builds upon practices that are going to be discussed in the next next session, which is secure passwords, two-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other reason why I would put the VPN first before the other good suggestion is because it's less stuff you have to um, own and kind of um, be custodian of. So like, oh, now you have to update um, the firmware on your router, if you have a router, as opposed to the beauty of a co-working space, is you just roll in, fire up, and you're ready to go. So, yeah, so I would put fire, um, VPN first, and then build your own network second. 
And I'm and I'm going to tell you why I agree totally with you, Ken. And I'm going to flip my I'm going to change my answer. If am I allowed to do that? And I'm going to put VPN first as well, um, which is that it, because if you if you implement that practice and your staff get used to doing that, then that benefits them just as much everywhere else they go. So it helps them not only when they're in the co-working space, but when they're at the Starbucks or when they're at their home or when they're at the airport or when they're in the hotel, um, because that practice of just booting it up, connecting to Wi-Fi and opening VPNs first thing helps them in all those different scenarios. So that's I'm, I'm going to change my answer, VPN first. Thank you, Ken. This is why it's good to have multiple people here. All right. Um, and that appears, let's see, Ben Chen has a question for um, security for personal devices from home. Uh, ben, do you have, um, so that was actually, I'm sorry, that was your biggest concern uh, in terms of your areas. Is there, did you have a question around that, about how to secure personal devices from home or practice for doing that or just saying that's your biggest challenge? if you're still here. Otherwise, I think we have handled all the questions. And I think we'll wrap up. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thanks again so much to Ken. Oh, wait, Ben's here. Oh, biggest challenge. OK, great. All right. Uh, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ben Gardner, for being here. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. And hopefully, we'll see you back in two weeks for your passwords are broken, how to fix them. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.